Uh, thank you very much for part one. And this is part two that we look forward to. And okay. you know, if you need anything, you got the floor. What we're going to do is uh, discuss some case studies. Can you all see the screen? Yeah, you're on a big projector. Yeah, cool. All right. So last time, what we did was, uh, you know, discuss ethics or ethics concepts in very broad brushstroke. <laughs> And in particular, we talked about um, ethical frameworks and different systems of values that you could think about, personal values, some that we called ethical values, which were things like do right, be fair, uh, professional values, societal values, and how some of those different things connected even to economic values, right? So a company has uh, values you know, to make good products, sell things, hopefully have happy investors, and so some of those things we said connected to personal values, like be fair, right? Sell a fair product. But in the end, those turn out to have economic impact. So you could think about economic values, many different ways to kind of frame the problem of uh, um, what do we do and what do we choose? And hopefully those kinds of things guide us when we don't have explicit rules to follow, which is pretty much all the time, right? There's rules that get thrown at us when we do things wrong, but there's not someone watching over us every day, telling us exactly how to handle our data or what papers to cite or any of those things. So thinking about ethical frameworks is hopefully useful and it enables all of us to do better work. So what we'll do is we'll have some open discussion where we play with some case studies and I'm gonna throw up the first one. You guys read through this. I'll try to remain silent and then we'll talk about it. But as you read through it, try to think about what are the values and note that some of these are more specific to academia, but in, in large part, they can also apply to work and industry. So everyone's going to read at different rates. I get that. But if you have made it all the way through, we can start a little discussion. And, um, you know, maybe the first place to start is what's fundamentally right or wrong with what VJ is doing? Fabricating a paper was said. Okay. Yeah, this might be difficult tip uh, for discussion because I can't hear very well. Yeah, I'll try to repeat the question. Yeah, but I didn't want you to end up doing the talking. If you want a student sitting next there to be translator so we save your voice, that'll work too. But everyone out there, you're going to really have to shout, especially with masks and such. Sorry, I'm probably louder than you are. Anybody want to be official talker? <laughs> Volunteers? There's bonus points for that, right, Tip? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. looks like I'll be the official talker. I'll do my best. All right. <laughs> so fabricating the paper, fabricating the status of the project. Yeah. What we've heard so far. All right. So, so there's a punishment for it, right? I mean, he's dismissed from the program, I believe. So where do, where do we stand on that as uh, the right or the wrong course of action? Thank you. And tell me why, I guess. <laughs> um, I think with, the, with uh, these actions, probably we should have gotten him kicked out of the program. His actions should have gotten him kicked out of the program. Yeah, but let's say it's you. I mean, um, you know, we can all say that. <laughs> yeah, we can all say, oh, I wouldn't do this. 
Um, but the guy made a mistake. The question is, does the does the punishment fit the crime and why specifically? So, you know, you can be the, the lawyer for the department now. Explain why that punishment fits the crime. He's lying to a government agency asking for funding, right? Okay, so that's it's a lie and a lie to a federal agency. And, and he also fabricated evidence to support his lie. So he has a title and author list. So that's direct fabrication to support. So this is not like something that he quickly responded to. He was asked a question and he said, oh, it's been submitted. This had a, some thought behind it. So that's that's going to be a pretty big violation of trust. But from what Dr. Kuba wrote, he might have actually been under the impression that was the right thing to do. Like maybe some of the senior folks said, you just write it as submitted. And he's like, oh, I don't know, but okay, and he does it. Yeah, there's no dispute. I don't think that he's doing this project, right? I mean, he's working on this thing. Maybe there's a manuscript on its way. Um, and he says, oh, I, I thought we did this all the time. Yeah, that's a very vague statement. Uh, I think thought he did this all the time. He's not saying that, oh, this person told me something like that. There's nothing behind that. Someone who's caught will most likely say something like that. Okay. Well, maybe we don't believe VJ, you know, that someone told him or that he actually believes this is done all the time. But what opportunities might he have had to learn that, in fact, this is the wrong thing to do? Well, you could have asked him if his project, I guess, in his lab, his mentor, his advisors, I mean, they're there to guide him through these things. And yeah, so it's it's great that you mentioned the mentor. They're there to guide him. We don't we don't know really what ha happened with VJ and the mentor, right? We're not given any details. And it's, it's, and it's more than one professor who actually kicked him out. That's true. Probably a committee. It's probably a committee, and they probably had uh, more evidence that was, than what we are being presented with here. Is as far as uh, his performance. Yeah, that's true. It's a little extreme. I mean, what's, it, what's extreme? I feel like dismissing him from the graduate program was extreme, but okay. I feel like withdrawing his grant proposal was reasonable. Okay, tell me why you think that. Because I feel like the graduate program was meant to allow people to grow and like learning situations and i feel like that was a moment where he could have learned to do better assuming that his intentions weren't malicious you know like assuming that he really did think that that was the common culture of the area and was too embarrassed to ask or we don't know his relationship with others or how they responded but I do agree with her drawing his grant proposal because he didn't follow the rules and he's asking for money. Yeah, that's a great comment. I, I'm not here to say right or wrong on any of these comments, but I love that we have some slightly different uh, takes on what happened. And indeed, I think these kind of case studies are always a little frustrating because we have very limited information, but we can discuss the scenario and you know what was the right or wrong or preferred action based on some uh, possibilities. So um, she mentions that, um, you know, VJ uh, could have thought it was right and it, university should be a learning opportunity. So let's think about this as a learning experience. You know, when there's a crime, some you know, like um, taking a life, for instance, we talk about first degree, second degree, third degree, and all that stuff. Um, we could think about the degrees of the crime and whether there was real intent here. Um, and I would point out that VJ is not a fifth year grad student, he's a first year grad student. So does that make does that make our sense of what happened and what his penalty was any different? And the fact that he's a first year versus say a fourth or fifth year grad student. We're not getting much forgiveness for VJ here. No, VJ's in trouble. <laughs> They've just gone through an entire semester with me. 
piece of the puzzle that I kind of am thinking about is he, he started with a rotation project, but it doesn't say he finished the rotation project. It says others finished it successfully. So, I mean, I want to give DJ the benefit of the doubt, but there's more to the story. There's more to this story. I'm sure there is. Yeah, so you're you're reading between the well, lines there, but I point. He's clearly on the front end or beginning of some project. So um, he's taken more upon himself to go and create a manuscript with authors and title and such. Is he taking anything from anyone by you know putting in this false information? The reputation part of everybody. Sorry. Okay. You mean the other co authors or the university or the department or whom? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. A lot of people first say, well, he's taking away an opportunity for others to potentially will, win the fellowship. If we're comparing students based on accomplishments, uh, when they submit their application, if he's falsifying his accomplishments, that maybe gives him a leg up over other students who are actually fairly representing their credentials. You know, that, that makes sense. But a more subtle issue is the one that you came to, which I like, that by assuming authorship, assuming titles, he's effectively taking away opportunity slash responsibility from others in the group. There may well be work to publish and a paper here, um, but not everyone is getting a chance to weigh in and be responsible for, um, for the work or for this, the supposition that there will be a work. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big deal when you write a manuscript and when you, it means everyone's responsible for the work. It's very difficult, especially in this current world where everything is highly interdisciplinary uh, to be responsible for the entirety of the work because we're best apt to correct errors and improve work in our sub-disciplines. And yet still, when it's an interdisciplinary work, formally, we're all responsible. So that means you really got to stretch and you know ask questions and work to make sure that you can stand behind the sum total of the work. In this case, VJ is, you know, in his first year and not very worldly wise, and he just takes it upon himself to claim that there's a work and certain authors, right? So it's it's kind of a form of theft. It's certainly a form of deceit. Um, let's imagine that um, this program of study, this uh, graduate program, does not have any kind of ethics course like Dr. Rumpf's. Right. You guys are going through all this nice professional training. You're learning about ethics. You're learning about authorship, all the things you need to do to be uh, successful professionals. Let's imagine this program is just not as sophisticated as the one you're enjoying, and they have no program on professional ethics. How does that change or not change the scenario? I could easily envision a, a first year graduate that just legitimately not know it. I'm sure he knows that that's wrong, but really thought that is the practice. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I think it's still wrong. But it's still like not as bad as if he was a fifth year and he had this as a resource. I think I'm starting to eke more forgiveness out of this crowd. <laughs> keep, work, keep working on him, Tip. We got to save VJ. <laughs> <laughs> I think it also depends on his history, though. Has he shown the history of doing this type of thing within that first year? We don't have that information. So. That is true. Being first year, I'm going to assume this is his first screw up, but yeah, it doesn't look the same. It's his first screw up. Yeah. If there were a history, we'd be more inclined to throw the book at him wouldn't we? You know, it's difficult with these scenarios to also separate the, the mistake from intentionality, right? Did he actually have an intention of deceiving? Or did he just deceive and didn't realize what he was doing was wrong? Maybe he didn't think very hard about it. Maybe he wasn't being thoughtful or intentional enough thinking about what his actions were, and he just did it 
quickly. Oh, it's due tomorrow. I got to crank this out. And so he makes a mistake and it is deceptive, but he didn't really in intend to deceive others. All of those things are hard to weigh. Um, if there were a program like Dr. Rumpf's class, um, VJ would really be in trouble, right? Because obviously he would have been told the do's and the don'ts. If there's no class like that or no structure for first year students to learn the do's and the don'ts, then it might shift the accountability a little bit. You know, right now our, our, our proclivity is to say VJ is responsible, he done wrong. But if there's no structure for formal training, it kind of makes, to me, um, a little bit of a culpability on the part of the department. You know, the department isn't training students. They're holding them to a high standard. You must not falsify or misrepresent. Oh, and if you do it, you're out of the program. But they're not making clear for first year students who maybe just don't know what the right things are to do. So that, that's kind of the mentality, by the way, you know, nationwide, I think uh, a lot of universities and funding agencies and to some extent businesses have started to recognize that this whole professional development ethics stuff is something we really have to pay attention to and talk about formally. Used to be that you could just assume people would come together in groups and go through programs of study and they just learn these things implicitly, we would say. Implicit means you kind of pick it up by osmosis, excuse me. <coughs> But now it's recognized, no, we need to have explicit training in these things, especially because, uh, um, well, to some extent, because people are coming from very different backgrounds and cultures. You know, I went to school in Louisiana. I can tell you that's different from how kids are getting trained in Massachusetts or Florida or Kentucky, another place where I did some study in Kentucky. You know, every part of the world is, is different. Uh, we have lots of international students, right? VJ sounds like he's, uh, you know, a foreign national. And who knows what the training background is for VJ. So increasingly, the assumption is, all right, we've got to have explicit training in all these things. So in some ways, you guys are ahead of the curve there by being part of this class with Dr. Rumpf. You know, you're on a, on a cutting edge of change in professional training that's hopefully going to make you uh, better prepared. Um, we'll move on. But does anyone else have any comments about this situation with VJ? What's the conclusion? Off with his head or yeah. poor guy going to get a second chance? <laughs> All right, we're not forgiving here. No, they're, they're going to crucify the poor guy. Off with his head, that's the decision. All right. All right, let's see if we can decapitate any others. Here's the next one. All right, it's the, it's the conundrum of De Deborah and Kamala. This one's long. I'll give you some more time. Remind me, Tip, we have till 4.30, is that right? Uh, 2.50. Two, two so we have yeah, like an your time. 20 minutes total. Right. Sorry, I'm forgetting the time zone, too. Me, too. <laughs> All right, well, whenever you're ready, you can yell out some comments. And your takeaway on Deborah versus Kamala. What's the fundamental problem in this situation? Appearances of manipulating this data by executing 
including information, but that information is uncertain. Manipulating data, if you can't yeah, do that. I heard that, heard that. Yeah, yeah. so um, I guess Kamala wants to remove some data. Deborah is not sure, wants to discuss it, right? Um, Kamala is afraid that discussing it is going to slow down the process. Um, what would be what would be some good reasons to not discuss it and just take out the data? Is there is there a scenario under which that's justified? We're, we're uncertain in what I'm getting. Given the existing information, no, they're not sure. I mean, there yep. needs to be some sort of justification for doing something other than uh, this will, uh, what's that point? Uh, other than that, this will get the, uh, uh, this will make it harder to get the paper published. There needs to be some other sort of justification. Like if it were, uh, if, the error was caused by power fluctuations. They need to at least somehow prove that, even if indirect. Right. Okay. So Kamala's pointing out this is going to slow down the process. That that seems to be her primary objection, right? Um, we're not, we don't we're not given information. Maybe Kamala doesn't have good arguments, but we're not given information about stronger arguments for why to remove them other than a hypothesis that power fluctuations were responsible. But Kamala points out, doesn't she point out she's the postdoc and has more experience? I feel like if she knows it's gonna make the process harder, then she knows that it's a valid error, it should be. Investigative work. Interesting. Yeah, Kamala says on that bottom line, she implies that she and Deborah should use their professional judgment to drop the points now. So Kamala's of the opinion that they have the information they need. It's it's in their professional purview to just drop the data points. Honestly, I would probably drop the I would actually probably include the data and say, hey, there's these two issues with these two points in specificness. Um, it's included so that you can see all our results. We're being transparent. But there's some sort of error here that is higher than the others. I think what you said, plot all the points, even the error points, curve fit without those points and say what you did. Yeah. OK. So do they even have to um, do that for a publication right now and commit to it? Or is there an intermediate step? Or said another way, is it just up to Deborah and Kamala to make this decision? Somebody, somebody there maintains the equipment. They would probably be able to offer their expertise. Yeah, that's that sounds right. Uh, they're, they're going to a national lab. Usually, you have to write a proposal to get time at the instrument. There must right. be a supervisor. There's a yeah, there's a PI. There may be some other people involved, and they're going to write a paper together. Right, the PI is going to be on that. So, if there's some important decision about keeping or not keeping data. Seems like everyone needs to be involved, unless it's something really trivial, right? I mean, it happens all the time that you start an experiment, you take a measurement, you realize, oh, I goofed up, I should have, you know, reset the baseline, or I forgot to subtract away the background, let me redo the experiment, and then you collect more data. Those two sets of data are not equivalent. You know, as the experimenter, there's systematic error in the first set, which makes it clearly inaccurate or less accurate to the true value you're trying to get. So you're, you're strongly justified in 
dropping that data set or at least moving on to the next data collection and the next and the next until you improve and get a data set that you think is most trustworthy and most representative of the thing you're trying to measure and then present that to a group. We've all got limited time and there's an expectation that we're not going to waste each other's time, right? Discussing erroneous data. And moreover, we're going to use professional judgment, which is what Kamala says. Um, but this is not necessarily a trivial situation. There's no clear systematic error that's being improved to reacquire data. There's simply a statement that these data, these two points or whatever should be thrown out relative to the others with um, a putative hypothesis for why they're suspect. So that's, that's kind of on, that's thin ice. And it's an expensive test. So there's monetary uh, repercussion to having to rerun data. Right, that's true. Um, Let's see, if they, if they don't tell people about the data, there's a danger, right? There's a danger of it kind of looking like a cover-up. Um, is there another danger? What are some other dangers of not telling the PI about the situation? Think about it this way. Is there something they might miss out on if they don't maintain transparency? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there may be a new discovery. It may be something that, that, you know, can be explained with a higher level of theory. It may be something that other minds on the problem, other more experienced uh, practitioners could look at and say, oh, yeah, this is, this is maybe something, you know, that we didn't expect or that we could explain in this way. Maybe we should do some other experiments. There's also potentially the, the trivial solution that the supervisor might say, oh, we actually have more beam time on the instrument. We can get these data, you know, collected or piggyback them on our next acquisition. I mean, who knows? But, you know, you got to give other people who are involved in the project an opportunity to contribute and maybe come up with those out-of-the-box solutions. You know how we always talk about out-of-the-box solutions? If you don't maintain transparency, that was a great word that someone used, be transparent. If you're not transparent, you don't give others an opportunity to weigh in and you kind of put yourself stuck in the box. You don't find those out of the box solutions. Okay, now I wanna shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about the Deborah Kamala relationship. Um, is Deborah in a tough spot in going up against uh, Kamala? Why or why not? Angel seniority question, right? Yeah, seniority. I think, I think yes, yeah. Yeah, seniority. I mean, uh, Kamala's a postdoc. Deborah is a grad student, right, in her third year. So Deborah's learning, right? She's got some advanced training already. She's a third year, but she's not as experienced as Kamala. So Kamala is in charge. Kamala is in a teaching slash mentoring role. Um, in its most essential step sense, there's this power differential. Kamala's up here and Deborah's here, right? So that power differential has a number of things that come along with it. One, it can be misused, right? Kamala could misuse her power and influence and tell Deborah, oh, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, just be quiet. Um, Deborah may instinctively feel shy to speak out, right? Um, especially if the relationship between the mentor and the mentee is not one that's nurturing, right? If Kamala pushes Deborah around all the time, Deborah's not going to feel comfortable bringing up problems. Um, so, you know, as students, it, 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 in any, actually in any uh, position, even within a company, there will be power differentials. Um, you got to figure out, you know, where you're happy working um, and, you know, what you're style of learning slash working is if you're in a situation where you're not able to grow, you're not able to express uh, opinions that you think can really help the effort, the research, the company or whatever, that's a tough situation to be in. It might be a corporate culture. It might just be the way the supervisor works. It may, it may be one that's not productive for you. And it's easy to say, oh, if, if that situation is tough, just leave. It ain't so easy to just, you know, quit a job or move on. Um, often what happens is that you have to apply another level of professionalism when you're in a Deborah-like situation. 
you know, in research, in academia, or in a company where you got to try to figure out, um, you know, how to get your opinion to carry over to the person who's in that power differential, right? Who's above you to persuasively make your case and hopefully convince them, especially if it comes from a place of conviction. You know, if you like Deborah really believe the data, we've got to do the best science that we can, or if you're in a company, we've got to make the best product that we, we can. Or if you're in a company or a situation like, you know, leading, making the component for the Hubble Space Telescope, they were engineers who saw the data and thought this is not right, but it did not carry the day with uh, project managers who are under the gun. How do you make your case in the best interest of the company and for the best and for your best interest and that of the team, um, even when it can set the team back and slow things down? It's a it's a difficult situation. Kamala is also uh, missing an opportunity. Any any sense of what Kamala is missing as an opportunity? It's subtle. All right, I'll give it to you and then we're gonna move on. You know, Kamala is in a postdoc. So she's in professional training probably to go into academia where she's gonna direct other students. It's not very common to do a postdoc and then go into industry. So I presume she's going to, into academia. Um, she has an opportunity here to, to be a good mentor, you know, and to refine her teaching and leadership skills. And I think she's kind of missing out on that. She's a little more fixated on rushing to publish and not valuing enough maybe the opportunity to be a good mentor to Deborah. So we talked about values, right? And if we think about it, Kamala's value is get the pub. She wants the publication and I can't tell there's much more. Deborah, I think is valuing something like the integrity of the data. Um, and maybe other things like the integrity of the team and their reputation. And I think uh, Kamala maybe could view this situation in a, diff in a different light if she had uh, emphasis placed on other values, like the, the importance of not mis misguiding Deborah, right? If she pushes Deborah and says, look, we should use our professional judgment. I'm a postdoc. I'm right. And doesn't listen to Deborah. That, that's, that's really making it hard for Deborah to grow as a scientist, right? So if we fix too much our values on one thing, we can miss other opportunities. Um, how many of you think this is a kind of common situation in the workplace? How many, uh, how many, how many think it's uncommon? Raise your hand, I can see those. Uncommon? Common is over here. Yeah, common. I think it's very common. Um, what do you think makes it a common situation? Looking for, such thing is for a one word answer. No such thing as perfect <laughs> measurement. Is that one word? Well, that's a good one. It ain't one word necessarily it isn't the word I was searching for, but it's a very valid point. Nothing is perfect, right? Right. I mean, when we says the sciences, it always looks very perfect, doesn't it? Perfect equations, perfect solutions, <clears throat> but doing real research and measurement and testing and product development is very, very messy. You have big error bars. And it's all about getting those uncertainties down to where you can be confident in your product, whether it's research or something that, you know, goes out to showroom floors and is sold or, you know, maybe sold on to other companies for incorporation into their products. And um, it's an imperfect, messy world. And so that means you have to make judgments. You have to make judgment calls. And I think particularly in a corporate environment, some of those judgment calls have to be looking toward the longer term. What are the values? Well, is it getting the product out the door? Is it having a product that's going to be um, trustworthy and that will maintain customer confidence? Because if the product is crummy, if you have to have a recall, if it doesn't perform to spec, if there's a fundamental flaw, you the company will lose business, right? And that hurts a bottom line down the road. But how companies and teams and managers think about those values particularly the, the time or the time dependent values, right? Like customer loyalty or, or brand confidence that can really uh, change a calculus on what to do. The thing I was thinking about though, is uh, ego. Think about ego. 
How do you think ego makes this kind of situation common or uncommon? Dead silence. Nobody's got ego. That's a good sign. No, Very humble way crowd. Too, here. Way too common ego. Yeah, everybody's got ego, right? I mean, a little bit of it. And, um, you know, we all we all like it when we're right. We kind of hate it when we have to admit we're wrong. And, um, you know, science and engineering probably, I don't know, maybe 90 percent of the time is about admitting you don't know or that you're wrong. Um, if you don't figure out what you don't know, you can't learn a new thing or do something novel or new. So we kind of in science and engineering, whether in academia or industry, are always kind of riding that edge of the know and don't know. And we've got to be willing to be wrong and let our ego go, right? We got to be willing to also treat people with respect when it turns out they're wrong, treat them with lots of respect when they're wrong and admit it, right? Kind of takes a team dynamic where you think about things, throw out some crazy ideas, see, see what sticks, see what pans out, uh, and then kind of recognize, oh, we got to the right answer. We had some crazy ideas on the way, but we probably wouldn't have got there without the ideas that turned out to be wrong, right? Because the, the team thinking is what got us there. So, um, you know, ego is, is something that I think can kill a project and can kill a team. And unfortunately, we tend to celebrate <laughs> those that are most successful either by luck or uh, really hard work or sometimes a combination of the two um, and not necessarily celebrate those that are making a team work well, especially when they're able to subjugate ego, right, and get things going. So think about ego and think about, um, you know, the opportunities you have to grow from sometimes admitting you're wrong, right, and how it can help a team. All right, uh, let's see what's going on with Joseph here. This is short. You can imagine there'll be other information on the page in just a bit. Why does he want to rush in one semester? <laughs> well, it doesn't say that he's 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 back, so he maybe he already spent a couple years on this, uh -huh. right? And he thinks he's almost done. And the advisor oh. says, "No, no." <laughs> So there, he's got a problem, right? What are some ways that he might have ended up in this problem? <clears throat> Yell it out. We actually discussed something like this uh, in our yeah. class, and this would be like a vague PhD proposal, something that could have, because that's what's supposed to dictate what uh, Joseph, the things that Joseph needs to accomplish to finish his degree. And at one point in our course, we touched upon that topic that it needs to be, it should be a, it, there should already exist a contract between Joseph and uh, Joseph's uh, advisor on exactly what he needs to complete it. It shouldn't be a surprise to you. Okay, but so he needs, he needs a, there should be a clear plan of what needs to be accomplished, right? So um, do we think that plan is in place from what we read? Probably the plan could have been more specific. Yeah. Whose responsibility is it to get that plan more specific? I think I'm hearing Joseph. Yep. Yeah. Just Joseph. Anybody else? And the advisor. Yeah, and the advisor. There's probably a committee, right? Usually, usually a graduate dissertation has a committee. Uh, it's mostly on the advisor, but the committee members play a role of reviewing the proposal, see if the plan is clear. All right, let's get some more details. We'll come back to this idea of the plan in a second. Thank you. 
Why did you want to rush? I say again. <laughs> Yeah, come on. Grad school is fun. Just stay forever. I think we're grinding the axe for, for Joseph here. <laughs> yeah, now the story is getting more into lack of communication. Really? Yeah. yeah. Joseph is going the way of VJ. Yeah. <laughs> I got a plan as well. No I forgiveness in this classroom. Yeah. Off crowd. All right. Let's try this. I see some heads nodding. People are a little less comfortable with crucifying Joseph now. Yeah, that, that could be true. This last point could be true. And that's, that's uh, I think it takes us back to the importance of uh, Salve proposal, right? So that everyone who needs their serve. Do you think what we said when we were presented with the first question was very applicable? Okay. So let, let's say that the supervisor really does want Joseph to get more results in part because that's gonna benefit, um, you know, her own research or is there a statement of a company? Let's see, self-serving for her own research, whatever that means. Is that necessarily um, bad for Joseph? I guess one is like hinky pinky kind of thing. Not, not sure where you're going. <laughs> not, it's like a, a quid, quo, quid pro quo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So okay, there there could be a quid pro quo of you know you help me get my right. research done, I pay for you as a grad student and provide the research, but. Um, Usually it's a little less, um, oh, what's the word? I can't, now I can't think of the word. It, it's usually less of a quid pro quo arrangement. It's usually that the supervisor and the student are working together on a joint, on a common project, right? Um, so, you know, they're probably going to both be authors on a publication. They'll both benefit from the research. This is usually the case in, in the sciences and engineering. Over in the humanities, it's a little different. Students tend to work much more independently, and in many cases, researchers and mentors are not even authors on their work if you're in the humanities. But in the sciences and engineering, it's co authoring teams between mentor and mentee. So, presumably, the supervisor's research is Joseph's research, and vice versa. It's, it's, it's very reciprocal. Um, so, maybe the supervisor knows something Joseph doesn't that indeed to have a successful dissertation and to go farther um, you know, toward that next step, he really needs another publication or, or some more research. The, one of the things that does come across my mind as I reflect upon the circumstances is he went on vacation and the advisor could have discovered something while he was on vacation. Yeah. What kind of grad yep. student goes on summer vacation anyway? Right? <laughs> Good question. What's that? I know. I know. A lot of grad students in my ethics workshop immediately say that. And, you know, before they uh, start grinding the axe, what is, what is Joseph thinking? He's on vacation. <laughs> so, so let's go back to that plan. Let's go back to that plan. Can we make a... Uh, can, can, can we make a research plan that has full details of what you're supposed to accomplish? No. No? Sometimes, sometimes it's possible, but oftentimes things evolve as the research moves. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Out with that evolution, you need good communication, right? I think that was highlighted in the second paragraph. Did not discuss the standards that lies there to kind of highlight a lack of communication. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think, you know, you guys in your discussion here have kind of hit upon it. 
I think it's, it's fundamentally challenging by the nature of the work, by the nature of research and the uncertainty and associated with it. It's very challenging to have a perfect mentor mentee relationship. On the one side, you want to do fascinating research that, you know, totally charges into the unknown and generates new knowledge or a new product or a new something, something new, something that nobody knew how to do uh, before. And yet one never knows how long that's going to take, right? On the other side, you want to have a graduate program with very clear expectations where people are set up to succeed, where they can put in their effort and, you know, are challenged, but um, they're not going to waste time. They're not going to have surprises uh, that, you know, prolong the, the graduate program in state institutions like mine and yours. Um, there's expectations from legislators and others that we should have a certain throughput, that you should be able to finish a degree in five years or whatever. But that's not necessarily commensurate with research, right? Sometimes things don't work out the way we expect. Sometimes the theory looks great. And then the experiment ain't what we expected, right? Um, and so it can take longer. There can be unknowns. How do you resolve that? Well, I don't know. <laughs> There's no perfect way. I think communication along the way helps. Uh, uh, to the point of the young person sitting in the center there, it takes communication and you need to communicate during the evolution of the project. But I think when a grad student enters into a program, they need to know it's not necessarily going to be, um, you know, all sparkles and sunshine. There's going to be some tough times and sometimes the project's going to go in the wrong direction. And you're going to have to say, oh, this, this is not working. I got to try something else. It's going to feel like you wasted a lot of time. Um, but a lot of that time is part of the learning process, right? And you can benefit it from it in ways that you don't expect down the road. And it is wasting time if it's not done rigorously. And it is wasting time if the plan is not as clear as it could be with, you know, very clear um, directions and, and methods to try. Um, but there is a lot of uncertainty. It's a very imperfect process. And frankly, there's some luck, right? We all like to think when we succeed, oh, it's because I worked really hard. And we like to applaud those that, you know, appear on top, win all the awards, publish all the papers or whatever, you know, that they're truly great. There's a lot of luck in pretty much everything we do, right? Um, so with whatever luck you're dealt, you make the best of it, right? You're in control of your ability to be diligent, to be rigorous, to be a communicator, right? If something's not going perfect, take that step and be a communicator and say, hey, you know, I'm in the program now, two and a half years. How am I doing? Am I on the right path? Can we review the plan? If you start to develop some concerns, you really have to Put your ego aside. Remember, we talked about ego. Be willing to be wrong. Go to the supervisor or in a company, go to the manager and say, hey, could we meet and assess where we are on the project? I want to make sure we're going in the right direction. So those are sometimes tough things to do. Anyway, anyone else want to make another comment on Joseph or shall we let him go? He's gone. All right. It's Peter's turn. This one's long. I'll let you have some time. All right, so um, 
What should Peter do and why? Yeah, an ideal world leader should accept this advice. Or maybe Jimmy's data is correct. Maybe there's nothing wrong. He's kind of presuming something. So maybe just talking would maybe clear this up. Maybe you should talk to Jimmy first. That's a good idea. Give Jimmy an opportunity to explain what's going on. Let's say you do that. Let's say Peter talks to Jimmy and Peter's not satisfied. Then what? Couldn't hear that. Go up the chain of command. I think. Okay, so that's probably go talk to the advisor, right? Jimmy is concerned about that, right? Jimmy's clearly got some appreh apprehension. What does Jimmy have to lose? Yeah, Jimmy's doing research that actually, or sorry, uh, Peter's doing research that actually depends on Jimmy's data, right? So in some sense, he's what people like to call a whistleblower. Peter himself would also be affected if kind of what he suspects is true. Right? Yeah, so Peter feels threatened, right? In from several several ways. Peter feels that his research is potentially in jeopardy if he if he doesn't speak, right? Because he doesn't know. Maybe Jimmy's falsifying this data and then his own research is messed up and so is his supervisors. Uh, Peter also feels some jeopardy because if he talks to the supervisor and Jimmy's information is wrong, then for sure his, he's got to start over with his research, right? Peter's in a, or he's going to be set back. Peter's in a tough position. Um, you want to have confidence in your data, right? And when you lack confidence, that's a real tough spot to be in, you know, in the sciences and engineering. He's, he's walking around trying to do this research and have reliable information, but he fundamentally distrusts his own information. Makes it very difficult to go and give a talk or talk to a supervisor or go and give a, a presentation at a company interview and not have faith in your own data. It's very tough to come across as credible when you don't believe your own work. Who would that neutral party be? That's a good question. I, think it would be. I, I would hope it'd be uh, another uh, reputable professor. Maybe okay, so it might be another department. professor in the department or... or Somebody, Somebody who the other, somebody his advisor may look up to. How about a committee member? Good. So, okay, so maybe he could go talk to a committee member. So let's imagine this. Let's imagine Peter, he's concerned about Jimmy. He's nervous about talking to his supervisor. So to get advice, he goes to talk to a committee member. And then the committee member says to the advisor, hey, you know, Peter came by and was saying he's concerned about Jimmy's work. How does that play out? So bad. Maybe redo the experiment, some of the experiments to test the data if they are correct or not. Re redo some minimum set of experiments. Okay, yeah, that, that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, if you're concerned about the trustworthiness of Jimmy's method or his data, you could try to reproduce it. Might be very useful for your own work, right? You know, so that you're not totally relying on someone else's work, just to try to get a sense of, just to try to build your confidence in method. That could be useful. Then you have a little bit more of a case, one way or the other, to, to, to talk to an advisor. Um, if, if Peter doesn't go talk to the advisor, if Peter talks to, you know, a graduate chair of the department or something kind of jumps the, the ladder. Um, 
what will that do potentially to Peter's relationship with the advisor? Okay, it might damage it a little bit. You know, it'll, it'll certainly make the advisor a little... The advisor may, may well want Peter to come to him first, right? You know, in some ways, when you have a problem with someone, you kind of owe it to them to go and talk to them about the problem. Um, what are some good reasons where you wouldn't go talk to that person if you have a problem with them? For some reason, imagine that the person wouldn't see their issue in the same way. For some reason, you think that. Then yeah, I guess if you think that, if you think the person is incapable of of reaching a rational decision decision with the information you provide them, right? Maybe would take it out on you, recrimination, that sort of thing, repercussions for bringing up the issue. Um, you know, then you might be justified. That's kind of what whistleblowers and whistleblowing organizations permit where someone is afraid if they speak out in the company and they'll get fired. Um, the organization that you can go and whistleblow to is there to try to protect you. Um, it's it's got to be pretty severe when you have to take that route, you know. Um, but, but there can be situations like that. I mean, one of those, we may talk about this, doesn't apply to this scenario, but uh, one that can happen is sexual harassment, right? If a, if a supervisor is sexually harassing an employee, it's very difficult to believe that the employee can go and talk to the supervisor directly, right? And expect fair treatment. Um, those, are, those are tough situations. That's where someone may be quite justified in going to someone else. Um, but those are very tricky situations and I'm not an HR specialist for sure. Um, but I have in my own group long ago seen situations where, you know, uh, an undergrad didn't realize what he was saying to a female undergrad was harassment. I think the guy was just kind of oblivious. He just didn't realize. Um, but the young lady did not feel comfortable talking to him or chose to come to me. Right. So she didn't tell him, hey, back off. She came to me. OK, I can understand that. You know, um, there's a there's a vulnerability for women in the workplace. Um, so then it was up to me to try to handle it. Turned out it was very, very easy to handle. I just talked to the guy and he didn't realize, wow, that he was being, um, or at least he said he didn't, he didn't realize he was being overbearing. So that was able, that was, uh, resolvable, but there can be other situations, you know, in the worst case where a supervisor, um, tries to force someone into a relationship, right. Using that power differential. That's really, really bad. Um, and that's a, a situation where a person can feel quite justified and would you know, probably be encouraged to go to a third party, go to a, talk to a chair. But for something like this, this is about professionalism. Um, it's about you know, uh, handling the data or the, or the measurements. I think, I think the supervisor is the person to go to and should have the opportunity to address the situation. Um, and if they have some major conflict of interest, because Jimmy is their favorite, as Peter thinks, um, well, then Peter has recourse. He could go to the to the next level. But, you know, that's just Peter's impression. And Peter's impression could be could be wrong. That word ego comes up again because um, Peter's got to kind of push his ego aside to deal with this. Right. If he raises the situation with the supervisor and is put down. Um, or is found to be wrong, maybe Jimmy's data is perfectly on the up and up. Um, Peter needs to be willing to, to be wrong, but he's got to push his ego aside for that. But it is a significant situation, one that he's got to deal with. Let's see, was there some other question that I had on this? Uh, oh, what is this? Uh, what is the significance of this statement? It says... Um, Yet, Peter also knew that if he waited to raise the issue, the question would inevitably arise as to when he first suspected the problems. Why do they throw that sentence in? What's the significance there? Well, Peter suspected that something, uh, 
in analysis was being done, he didn't want to be included as an accomplice to that. He was kind of thinking in that way. Maybe if he, uh, maybe if he uh, spoke out too late, then he would probably be implicated in whatever incorrect measurements were being made. So, well, another way of looking at that is to think, okay, how much research was actually affected by the incorrect results? And, you know, when the problem is discovered, you can look at all the research after that, that involved that particular data. And it's kind of like being able to go back and to try to figure out what, what is what, uh, what is correct and what is yeah, so if there is a problem, the longer you wait, the more research is in jeopardy, right? And the bigger the problem is to sort out, the more arduous it is to go back and review all of the information and figure out who made their research dependent upon Jimmy's work and is therefore, you know, potentially subject to error. So there's a problem. The problem potentially grows with time the longer he takes to bring it up, right? But it kind of sounds like, why, why should he be afraid of the question, when did you first suspect the problem? Why should that be a concern? I guess it's hinting he's been suspicious for a while and didn't speak up. I think so. Um, you know, maybe it's been one month, maybe it's been three, six, a year. Why didn't you speak up? You know, maybe he's concerned. Sounds like he's concerned on the one hand that the supervisor will favor Jimmy, right? And um, say it's not a problem. On the other hand, it sounds like this has been a problem for a while and he's afraid maybe the supervisor will be mad with him, uh, not because he favors Jimmy, but because he should have brought this to his to the supervisor's attention a lot earlier. So now there's a problem if he lets that get, some, get in the way and he doesn't bring up the issue, then the problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Suddenly, it's not just Jimmy falsifying data, it's him being part of a cover-up, effectively, <laughs> right? If you see something, and you think something's wrong, you have a duty, you have an ethical duty to report it, right? Because uh, if you don't, then you become effectively a passive participant. It's a little bit like bullying, you know, the whole thing of uh, hopefully it doesn't happen in graduate school or in universities, right? Um, but bullying happens in high school and junior high, right? Um, and it ain't good, it ain't very comfortable. So it's one thing if you're a bully, it's quite another thing if you stand around and watch a bully and you do nothing about it, right? Then you're kind of participating indirectly in what's going on. And so that's what a cover-up is about uh, or, or not speaking out. It's about allowing something that's fundamentally wrong to continue. You're not responsible for doing it, but you're not preventing it. So in effect, you're contributing to it. You're enabling it to happen. So that line of reasoning really... Uh, is a call for action. It really puts uh, an onus, a responsibility on all of us to not just do our own work, right, but to pay attention to what's going on. If we see something that doesn't seem right, you know, call it out. And sometimes rather than thinking about it like you're a policeman and you got to be, uh, you know, a policeman that makes sure everyone else is doing what they're supposed to, you can think of it maybe as being your brother's keeper, right? People may not realize they're doing something wrong. We're trying to help each other. We have each other's back in the best case. So there's a good reason to be um, trying to stay aware, you know, take ownership of the responsibility to not just do your own work really well, but be aware of what's going on. And if you see something that's not right, speak out because you may be helping a colleague do their work better, right? And in the worst case, if there is something really um, nefarious going on, right? Someone's faking data or something, um, and you don't speak out, now you're part of, you're enabling that, uh, that bad activity to continue. Yeah, so this, this ethics thing is really not just about what you should do, shouldn't do, it's also about what you should do, right? Um, and I think 
I think it's a little bit easier to take on some of that responsibility if we think of ourselves as not just individuals, but functioning as part of a community or a profession, right? You're all going to be engineers. Um, so people rely upon engineers and trust them to do good work because they expect engineers can work together. So part of that is maintaining the quality of your profession and being willing to speak out when you see something not quite going right. Any other thoughts on Peter and Jimmy or his nameless supervisor? Or are we gonna let him go? Are we hanging right. anybody? How much more time do we have, Tip? Um, we have 12 minutes, if I can do the math correctly. All right, I'm gonna skip this one because we kind of talked about it already. <clears throat> All right, who wants to help Robert? <laughs> Guy in the back corner is totally <laughs> saying, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> what happens in this classroom stays in this classroom, won't go back to the Bible. <laughs> that wrong desert. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> Come on, Robert needs your help. All right, let's imagine it's Robert's first job. He's a, he's a young kid straight out of school. He has no attachments, not many responsibilities. What should he do? He's got his whole career in front of him. I think it's okay because it had to be sent for physical review. If it wasn't being sent for review, then I would say he would be the only option. It clearly had to go through somebody else before he could submit it. So physical review is a is a very prestigious journal in physics. Um, so he's he's submitting it there, and then it is a peer reviewed journal, so it will go out for peer review. And the you know the issue here is about authorship. So. Um, I guess the head of the group says that since he's Peter, since he's Robert's boss, he needs to have his name on the paper. But the code of ethics for authorship is that everyone listed as an author must have contributed to the work substantively. And um, each author is responsible for the content of the work. So Robert's conundrum here is that he knows the supervisor did not contribute to the work. Yeah, you should fight it then. I, I would probably fight it, but I definitely include them in like an acknowledgement and like okay. top front building high loading all of them. Yeah, so that's an interesting workaround. You can at least acknowledge the supervisor. You can stick anybody you want in the acknowledgements, I suppose. Um, let's imagine the supervisor is not happy and says, I told you to make me an author. You're fired. <laughs> Um, would, would it be a problem if you were like the last author? Well, whether you're first or last or middle author, everyone's responsible for the work. This is a loose lose. Like, like, start when, when, when you're in that situation, first thing he needs to reach out to or find the HR point of contact because he's in a He's in for a poop storm. <laughs> so, I heard some of that tip. It sounded like HR was involved, which always gives me the shivers. What was said? Uh, there's a poop storm coming, I think was said. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Okay. For Robert or for his boss? <clears throat> Is it obvious that, that Robert doesn't have a lot of trust in his supervisor and he gives repercussions? So, and unfortunately, he has to share with HR in case he gets repercussions. And just to kind of open, be prepared to reach out from that level before it's too late. But then he has to acknowledge and defend himself and say, sir, you, you didn't provide input to this paper, and I need to proceed to, with, with my original plans and then just. Be prepared to follow up with HR, which you likely have to do. Okay, so yeah, hopefully in the organization he has some um, repercussions or some some that's not the word. He has some options uh, that he can take. Um, in in the short term, he doesn't trust his boss. Maybe this is a really crummy boss. I mean, he 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 could he could suffer, right? I mean, in the worst case, maybe he loses his job. Um, you know, maybe he has to go through HR or go through the courts and maybe he gets a uh, compensation. Maybe he gets his job back. I don't know, but it's going to be a tough path. I mean, there's a tough, even if in the end he is, um, you know, he comes out on top, there's going to be uh, a tough couple of weeks, if not more for him, if this boss really is pushing it. The, the boss is potentially using the power differential, right? The boss has power over Robert. So, there's a professional standard and professional values. And those say you have to have contributed to the work to be an author. The supervisor hasn't, so he cannot be an author. But the supervisor has other values. <laughs> says he wants to be on the work. Um, so why not give him an opportunity to actually provide some sort of intellectual contribution as another option? Okay, but yeah, that's interesting. And maybe that was a- I haven't been submitted, that kind of thing. There's still time to do that kind of thing. Yeah, um, it's interesting to think that, you know, maybe he could have reached out to the supervisor and said, hey, do you want to contribute to this work? Get approval for it. It's not really, I don't know, you guys let me know if I've missed something. It's not clear to me. Was he doing this work while at the company? Or is this just work coming out of his postdoctoral fellowship? I'm not clear. I read it as this happened at the company. Yeah, so on company time, he did the research. I, it's not clear to me whether the research is part of the company or. All we know is it's a large engineering company and they could be building a token map. Could be, could be. Um, it sounds like then that if it's, if it's work uh, that happened as part of the company, there needed to be some guidelines as to what they were going to actually do with this work. Are they going to develop it and then maybe publish it? If so, do they have a clear understanding within the company as to who is going to be an author? This must be something that they've thought about. Um, if it was done on company time and not part of company work, that's a separate problem, right? And um, the supervisor can have an issue with Robert, but not necessarily whether he includes him as an author. If it, if it is work that was done as part of the, the company's effort, which it kind of sounds like it, um, I wonder why the supervisor thinks he should be on the paper. Could it have been his original idea or is he just administrating the project? I was going to say an interesting tangent conversation. Suppose the supervisor was just their idea, but after that didn't do anything. Does that constitute authorship? Let's discuss that. It's a good point. This is an idea, but the idea that I need to work on it, have somebody else work on it. It does have some apply as some sort of direct intellectual contribution because it's their idea. That's a good argument. That the idea is the intellectual contribution. Or at least part of it, right? You might sketch something out and say, here's a new invention, but then the reduction to practice where you actually create it or work out, you know, all of the engineering complications to, to get it to a functional prototype, that also has significant intellectual contribution. There's also an intellectual contribution in actually writing the paper, you know? I mean, we talk about authorship. Who, what, what is an author? It's someone who writes the paper. 
well, a lot of the work that goes into it is not actually writing the paper. You know, it's doing all the research, but writing the paper is also one of the contributions. So there's a number of ways that people could contribute to a work and uh, people can debate quite validly who gets to be, say, the first author on a paper. You know, is what is the most significant intellectual contribution? Is it just, is it coming up with the idea or is it working out all of the difficulties? And people disagree on that. You know, even within uh, departments and disciplines, I've seen people disagree on order of authorship and that sort of thing. Um, but what did we have anyone who said uh, coming up with the idea is not enough or did this group agree? coming up with the idea is enough to be an author. Did one say it's enough? I think that's much more typical what happens at a university. Very often the advisor's kind of seeding little ideas and guiding, but not actually going in the lab and looking things They up. don't do anything. They advisors don't do anything. Useless, completely useless. Right. <clears throat> or maybe raising the money, right? Putting forth the, the proposal and getting the money for the project. But then after that, they're guiding. And the real hard work is done by students. Yeah, so I, I think most people would agree coming up with the idea is a significant contribution. If the supervisor did come up with the idea, I think it'd be a good case to be an author somewhere on there. Um, but we don't know. And so it, you know, it might be a tough situation for Robert. Let's say last thing, and then you guys are going to have to end the class here. Let's say Robert uh, bites the bullet and makes him an author, even though he didn't intellectually contribute. Can that be a problem for Robert down the road? Are we stumped? Stumped? Might All right, I'll give questions later. Yeah, it could raise questions later. I mean, at, at one level, we might say it's just an issue of fairness, right? That Robert should get all the credit for doing the work because he did the work and the supervisor shouldn't be able to be an author and mooch on some of the, the, the benefits of being an author. Um, but it, it's more than that. It's more about, you know, uh, ethical ethics and ethical impact to your career. If Robert bows to this pressure and makes the supervisor a co-author and if it comes out later that he let this guy ghost author, and just be on the paper, then he's he's basically giving into a conflict of interest. Robert has broken a, a, a rule of professionalism that could haunt him for the rest of his career potentially. You know, might not be as uh, might not be a huge penalty, but it ain't a good thing. That's gonna that's gonna follow him potentially for the rest of his career. Um, so so Robert's in a tough spot of making be making a short term decision that gets his boss off of his back. But while he might make a decision that favors the boss and gets the boss off his back, he'll be adding to his back the burden of having fundamentally done something wrong in um, authorship and in professionalism of, of his discipline. So he'll trade one problem for another. This, this kind of situation, I think, is not that common anymore. It, it, it was in the past, but there are much more clear guidelines now on what it takes to, to be an author and how scholarship should be done. Um, but there's other ways where a boss in a power differential can unduly impose power. And so it's something to watch. Um, I think we're gonna be out of time here. Uh, so Tip, did you have any other topics you wanted to cover? I'm sure I do, but I, yeah, unfortunately we do have to end it here. Right. But well, we may some, come up with more things that we can maybe do an email conversation. Sure. Or, um, you know, students will go off and think about these things. And if you guys come up with a scenario or a question or uh, feel free to email uh, Dr. Rumpf and he can forward it on to me and you guys can find me out on the web and I'd be happy to take a shot at it. Um, I usually find in the middle of a lecture or whatever, uh, I have one or two questions. And then after the lecture, I have 10. So um, I'd be happy to hear from you guys if you have any other issues. Other than that, it uh, looks like we're done. So I'm going to sign off and say thank you for uh, engaging and giving me your opinions on some of these case studies. Thank you for paying attention in Dr. Rump's class. I think it's super important. I think it's going to be super helpful to you guys, and you're going to see benefits from it down the road for many, many years as you look back on some of the things that you learned with Dr.
Dr. Rumpf. Um, he's a fantastic collaborator. I'm really glad to work with him. So you got to have this class with one of the best. And good luck with uh, good luck with your career and everything you're doing.